Welcome to the Startup Operator Podcast. I'm Roshan Karyapa. If you had asked me last year when I started the podcast, who were the top five operators you'd want to talk to, Deepak Abbott would have figured in that list. Deepak is a battle-hardened veteran of the Indian startup ecosystem. And over the last two decades, he has come to define the growth function, identifying high potential levers in product or marketing or elsewhere to scale the business. And he's seen true scale. I mean, zero to 300 million users kind of scale. In this conversation, we spoke about some of the principles of both qualitative and quantitative aspects of it and how he's executing in his current avatar as founder of India Gold which provides instant gold loans and secure gold locker services. They say good things come to those who wait, and it was especially true in this case. It was an immensely satisfying conversation to talk to Deepak at length. So do check out this audio-only podcast. We have plenty of ground to cover. So let's dive right in to this episode of The Startup Operator with Deepak Abbott. Hey, Deepak, welcome to The Startup Operator podcast. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you, Roshan. I think this is my second time here. I always love talking to you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I really want to have this conversation and I've been looking forward to this for quite a while now. So Deepak, I think, uh, you know, last year was extremely special for you. After many years of being a senior exec at companies like Paytm, you started up India Gold, right? And uh, what has that one year as a founder, one year or something as a founder taught you? What was it like to reset, get back to fundamentals, not have a safety net and plenty of those things, right? Associated with the the founding journey. What what has that, uh, you know, year and something uh, taught you? I think if I have to relive my last 14 months, I don't have any benchmarks. I can't compare this experience with anything else that I've done in last 20 years of my career, right? So it's, That's amazing. It's positive sense. Sometimes I was overwhelmed. Sometimes relook at your decision, why you even, you know, even did this, something like this. Because let me be honest, you know, when you are in middle of crisis, you, you know, you question your choices, right? And, and that has happened to me at least 10 times in the last 14 months, right? So... It's not that rosy, yes, but I would still not go back and change anything, right? Because all of those moments where you are, you know, trying to figure out where you, you feel that you are stuck, you always find a solution, right? And that that is something where, you know, I would say any entrepreneur who's out there trying to build something, no matter, you know, what product you're building, no matter what domain you are in, you know, we all face challenges, which generally we don't share. I mean, we only talk about good things. Someone talked about their funding and new hiring and new product launches. But what goes behind, I think I have learned in the last 14 months. So hats off to, you know, people who've been doing this for years. And really, I think um, it's much harder than one can imagine. But like I said, very, very humbling experience. You do things which you thought, you know, you would not, you know, you've grown out of those things. But I think it definitely adds a new dimension to my career. I, and like I said, you know, I would not change anything despite... Right despite, you know, facing uh, some of the tough times in the last 14 months. A lot of happy moments, a lot of excitement, a lot of joys, even small, small joys. I think the beauty of, you know, beauty of building something is that uh, extremely small things start to give you pleasure, right? And then right. you start realizing that how we missed celebrating those small wins earlier in life because here it's all about, you know, keeping yourself motivated by Know, building bit by bit. So yeah, that's what my, I think my summary of my last one year uh, has been uh, and I'm looking forward to several years ahead building India Gold further. And I hope, you know, I continue to have same amount of excitement uh, and fun and learnings going forward. Yeah, that's a great place to be at, actually, you know, I mean, uh, and, you know, I quite empathize with what you're saying. The highs are high and the lows are low, right? But yeah, I mean, the amount of skin in the game that you have, it can be both excitement and anxiety, right? In equal parts, almost. On various days, it could be various things, right? Yes, so, yes. and not, in fact, during the day, you go through multiple emotions. <laughs> yeah, it's never a straight line, never a yeah. straight line. Uh, so... You know, Deepak, let's uh, take a step back, right? And look at your career itself. I find it super interesting, right? You've operated at the intersection of product and marketing and what we call as growth, right? The quintessential idea of growth is, you know, you identify certain high leverage levers uh, irrespective of what function it belongs in, whether it's sales or partnerships or product or marketing or whatever, and then, you know, optimize it, tweak it and scale it basically to move the needle, right? Do whatever it takes essentially to move the needle. I wonder if you can talk about you know, that evolution itself of your journey, right? How how did you stumble upon growth specifically? And what has that uh, journey been like? Before I talk about how I started, you know, focusing more on the growth side, 
I was not even sure till about I think 2007, 8 that I can be a good product manager. So earlier I used to, before I became a product manager, a designated product manager, I, I didn't know that I was actually doing product management even before that, but I never called myself product manager. I was you know doing web designing, then I started coding, I started developing websites, and then I became you know a designer, a UX designer, then I became a UX consultant, consulting for literally you know MNCs like World Bank, GSK, GE, Telstra, traveling all around. Again, you know those were literally tasks which I used to do were product management tasks. But since my designation was UX consultant, I thought product management is something different from what I'm doing. But when I got a chance to officially become a PM, uh, it was a gaming company and I I was designated as product manager. I said, okay, I'm doing exactly the same thing I used to do in my previous job. I try to understand the market need, try to define a target group of users who would potentially be using the product, understand their needs, understand their problems, and try and see if uh, the interface that we will design uh, and, th- and that interface could be, you know, uh, uh, could be consumer focusing, business focusing, but the interface that we design will eventually, you know, uh, solve problem for the, for the customers to, to an extent, right. And also it's not just the interface. So interface is what consumer sees, but you know, how, what kind of platform should it be built on? What kind of technology should be, you know, should we be using? What kind of, uh, you know, infra we need for that. So all that obviously came along with the package. So, you know, that's when I realized that, you know, okay, technically product manager has to be the custodian of UX while UX person is primarily responsible uh, for ensuring that, you know, the customer experience is taken into account when you're designing any flows. But for product manager, there are a lot of things that goes behind the scene, which is not seen, but indirectly impacts customer experience. So that if I have an unstable product, my API cannot support concurrent requests. I my database is crashing or the choice of technology is not being made. The platform we chose was not stable. SDKs that we chose to use were not right for the end customers. The events that we triggered were not you know, yielding the right result. So all those are decisions which also mm-hmm. impact customer experience. For example, a UX person, I mean, I'm not saying that you know UX people don't do it, but a typical UX person, uh, people I've interacted with will not you know, go into specific details of you know, how many tickets are being created, customer tickets, and, uh, you know, are we solving it on on time or not? Because that also impacts customer experience, right? Because a bad customer service is the worst form of customer experience. I mean, you can build a beautiful interface, but if you don't serve your customer well, you can uh, literally lose them uh, despite building one of the best flows, best uh, information architecture, best navigation, best content, right? So so that also, uh, like I said, as a product manager, you know, you, you start looking into, uh, things which are not clearly in the bucket of UX, right? So I, mm-hmm. so then I, you know, transitioned to a product manager from UX, which was a natural transition, I would say. Since I had done, you know, coding earlier in my life, it was easier for me to bind all the three things together. And then, uh, you know, uh, when you, and considering I was building games for international market, uh, you realize that, you know, once you build a product, you launched a product, most product managers would feel happier about going through the journey of launching and building the product. Now that's the most, like I said, exciting part. But that excitement dies down very quickly when you don't see much usage happening, right? Right. Because no matter, like I said, no matter how much sweat hard, how much hard work you put in bringing the product to life, how much research you've done, how much effort you made talking to customers and and launch the product. But for some reason, if it doesn't take off or the growth is slow, all that means nothing, right? I mean, if I was to today appraise my product manager, I will not appraise, I will not give good ratings just because he or she launched the product or built a very good product, right? Let's say bug-free, crash-free, fantastic experience, but you know, there's no usage, right? So it all boils down to the usage of the product. So if the core is usage, product manager can say, yes, I, let's hire a marketing guy. Let's start doing install campaigns. Let's start doing retention campaigns. Let's start doing remarketing. Well, all that is great, but person can say, oh, you know, I, I need a marketing person. Now that's great. You definitely need a marketing person because we are not expecting product managers to champion online slash digital slash advertising, right? Any form of advertising. I mean, we are not expecting product managers to understand how to operate Google AdWords or operate Facebook ads while, you know, most product managers know it's very easy to do it, but you know, you will get a support of marketing person, but marketing doesn't mean growth. Marketing person mm-hmm. 
will do campaigns for you optimize campaigns for you they will create right kind of segments for you and and target them but as a product manager you need to ensure that when those ads are running and those customers come to your app you are able to now handhold those customers and walk them through the entire life cycle from acquisition to conversion to retention mm-hmm. right now that is where the word growth came in right mm-hmm. growth is not just about digital advertising and getting users that's Correct. marketing right and anyone can do it i mean you just need to spend money right now if you look at startups in india 90% startups are not able to raise vc money right so they also need to grow so what you do you can't do advertising that's where the concepts of growth come in okay if you have 100 users and you got those 100 users through all the organic channels now as a product person who is responsible for growth i will say okay i don't have money to spend okay let me see you know what channels i can explore i can look at all the social channels that i have i can you know ping all my friends all my family create a referral program write blogs do content marketing put uh, videos on youtube try you know do multiple things which gets me optimize my as to optimize my seo do a lot of things which gets me at least 50 60 70 100 users right and then even though that base looks smaller but at least it starts to give you data so as a product manager you know you need to understand that when 100 users come to my app what kind of funnel is created how many people end up uninstalling the app on day, on on day one how many sign up how many actually convert whatever the conversion is it could be a transaction app it could be content app it could be you know a video app or an ad tech app as long as you know there is an action which you expect your customer to perform you can measure conversion and then once that conversion happens then you know how frequently do they visit the site uh, or app how frequently you know do they you know open the app during the day or during the week or during the month depending on the use case and uh, do uh, what is the frequency of their repeat transaction if if they actually you know come back so so all these will give you a lot of insights and confidence to get another set of 500 users because now you know that right. okay these 100 users they delivered x value to me now that value you could be pre revenue you could be you know uh, your those transactions could be non monetary transaction but you know you at least have a notional value a user creates 100 users have created let's say a notional value of x rupees for you now you can even if you are bootstrapped you know that you know okay there is a clear model of money going in and the output which has a notional value because when you go out and raise funds tomorrow you can clearly show that okay you know i have spent x amount on marketing and it has resulted in 5x 10x 20x of multiple in terms of the roi and that, that i'm getting right so the point i'm trying to make here is that uh, while digital advertising obviously speed things up but growth is different from that growth starts once you started getting users in and those users can come in through like i said organic non organic right. right and that's when you know i i said okay you know if my products do not work and we continue to believe that okay next feature will bring in users or next next feature will help me retain users that never happened if you continue to build features as a product manager and hoping that you know it will it will improve the metrics no i think if let's say as a good product manager you already before you built the product you already you know understood the consumer problem and built a basic working product just ensure that at least that is being used you know there are benchmarks being met right instead of building more feature right? right so so that's where i think i realize that while product managers you know like i said you know are the most valuable uh, resource for any company but growth becomes an integral part of product and i had a choice when i joined paytm in 2010 that even though i've done product management for 6 7 years should i be you know continue doing product management or should i risk and see if i can focus purely on growth and someone else builds the product so i joined paytm purely as a head of growth so there's clear demarcation that i am not the product manager right even though my experience was always in product management uh, the reason i wanted to do growth at paytm was there was the first time in 2010 i got a chance to work on an android app for which was india focus you know i had built games on android android and ios for international market but building games versus building a transaction app was to- and that too for india market and i'm talking about 2010 when android right. base itself was like little less than 15 20 million right, right. so uh, it was like literally a laughable thing to say that you know we are focusing on mobile we, where whereas you know everyone including flipkart at that time and all other uh, players were big on big on desktop because that was the only viable medium to get customers but i think vijay was very clear that future is not going to be this large screen future is going to be mobile i think there was a, a very clear understanding internally we may look like uh, way early into the game 
but all our energies i mean it should be 80 20 80% focus goes on mobile and you know while desktop is good to have because that's because that's giving you value transactions traffic customers so, so no point you know mm-hmm. losing that but once we get customers to start using a mobile app we knew that the retention rates will be higher the engagement will be higher and you know we'll literally be learning lot more about consumer journey than what you get on uh, just on the website right and and the good part was when paytm went and started focusing on mobile back in 2010 uh, there was hardly any competition i mean on mm-hmm. play store i remember there were hardly any indian apps there's no there's no flipkart app there's no amazon app back then there's no mintra app there was i mean these were these were you know popular apps back then or uh, popular uh, startups back then but they none of them had an app right so so that was something which uh, i think personally for me gave me a runway to learn and experiment and fail because the cost of failure was very low right because we could fail and still you know not lose anything because you know we were anyways betting on future and not really you know setting ourselves large targets to get customers to start on vetting mobile mobile for us was a playground we wanted to collectively learn as a team from tech point of view from product point of view from ux point of view from growth point of view right so i started running campaigns on facebook and google and you know literally in 2 rupees 3 rupees used to get an install and because yeah. literally the inventory was available there was there's no good old days only international games were advertising in india so and even users who were buying android phones back then like really they were like alpha user they were smart people who were early adopters of technology so uh, when they were searching for apps the only indian app the prominent one they could see was paytm so you know for us acquisition was much easier right so that was relatively i'm not saying you know it was hmm. just launched the app and people started uh, installing it but for us that was less of a problem for us getting users in became less of an issue but idea was that how do we really convince them that when they put their credit card or debit card number on mobile it's easy it's it's safer it's faster because people were used to bigger screens these were same users who had desktops as well and they were now you know starting using smartphones right mm-hmm. we hardly had mobile only users back then right. so now if you're suddenly used to large screen and you know you ask to do certain things in smaller screen now there the user experience was really important that how you really remove things which as a designer as a product manager we were so used to putting in because we had a lot of real estate on desktop so those optimizations for like at least one year when like i said we had no competition we learned everything without really you know worrying about the numbers and i think that gave personally an edge to me where you know i think i like i said you know at the cost of paytm being very generous allowing me to had the growth i could you know uh, spend one year literally it was like a paid course for me learning how growth works how to get users to start sign up on on mobile app how to get users to save their credit card debit card on app how to get them to reach out how, how to get them how to even you know optimize push notifications how to optimize in app notifications you know how to even track users coming in from different sources i had an head start learning all these technologies you know i remember back then it was you know there were hardly any sdks which you used to send targeted push notifications we couldn't even track most of the events yeah. but all that you know we i learned like i said i had no pressure all thanks to vijay and i think the entire early paytm team where i had a you know open canvas and i could you know build myself into someone who understood or someone who handled growth grounds up so so that is where you know my transition from product to growth happened once i you know had a grip on how the customer life cycle journey works that's when you know my second stint at paytm i you know started doing product again because now i knew that you know growth is something that comes naturally to me and product is my core competency so let's combine these two and ensure that you know even before we build the product mm-hmm. let's think of all the growth hooks let's think of all the growth mechanics that will come later once we launch the product so i think that is where i would say you know last 20 years have been spent and thankfully you know i get to do that all over again at india gold i'm again like i said reusing some of the knowledge that i gained in last 5 6 years uh, i'm learning a lot of new things a lot of things have changed you know i was less hands on for last 3 4 years and i'm actually happy to be hands on back again yeah it's the full circle once again i'm you know again trying to do things which i thought you know will you know not do like for example uh, creating a campaign for myself okay. opening google ads and you know selecting keywords to be you know <laughs> keyword to be uh, targeted you know those are things which looks exciting to me now again right so so i'm happy about i'm i'm like a child you know getting access to my old toys uh, when i was a kid 
and suddenly you know those toys looks very really, uh, you know good to me so i'm i'm in, i'm in that stage right now so yeah pretty happy no complaints uh, good part is now we are you know we are a 50 member team we hired specialists now and there are people who are now uh, you know focused on you know building it in a more structured way i think first right. eight nine months were like we were all building the poc we were all trying to figure out what works what doesn't work thankfully now we have some structure in mind we know you know uh, what are our key levers what are our key metrics what is our the you know, north star metric so we have those you know broad kpis in mind now so thankfully our product is not taking shape keeping those kpis in mind so you know the features that we need to build the features that we need to delete the user journey that we need to build it's all built keeping those growth kpis in mind right wow so you have given me like a a whole podcast worth of questions to ask you based on that answer itself yeah i mean 2008 2010 was an entirely different time right i mean prehistoric era i would say right uh, <laughs> i mean some of it sounds absurd right now convincing people by the way people... Oh, in, 2000, in 2008 right hmm. and, and in 2008 netflix used to be a cd rental yeah. company right <laughs> and i got a chance to work on the first web series oh wow <laughs> back in 2008 when the concept of web series didn't exist nice right so i've been lucky that i was at the right place at the right time and that web series starred tom hanks so i got a chance to work with him wow that was released on yahoo movies in us obviously didn't work so obviously uh, <laughs> can't claim that it was a hit it worked for some time but you know it wasn't a mega success because like i said the concept was too early for its time right it was a, it was a seven episode the web series and uh, you know when i look back that in itself was quite visionary i mean obviously it wasn't my idea right. i was just there to there to work on the product it was someone else's idea but you know whosoever idea was that i think they were thinking ahead of the time and now you know if if you look back i think web series looks like oh yeah in 2008 you know even if you were told netflix about it uh, and i remember you know when we were discussing selling the rights Uh, right. we only had youtube and uh, yahoo movies in contention right <laughs> i mean netflix was not even like on you know in anywhere in contention i mean it was it was there it used to had it used to have movies but we never realized that you know netflix could do something like web series right yeah so so like i said you know so i you know, i've been lucky been at the right places at the right time right you know i i'm getting all nostalgic right thinking about that time and one of the things that you mentioned uh, that is like super important and i feel that something that's missing right now is how at that time you could see that everybody is sort of doing everything right everyone was running a one hand one leg uh, short of the amount of work that they had to do right and the functions were not so siloed i would say like some of the stuff that we're seeing right now whether it's you know marketing or product you were pretty much joined at the hip with all of these people right and uh, and it was i think it, it was awesome because there was no other way you could kind of complete the feedback loop right i mean it was so close to the ground right yeah, uh, like, just... like for example today startups even at their early stage you know they would have a marketing person a growth person and a product analyst and a product manager right mm. now crazy yeah like not crazy i think that's the right way to do it because you know you literally you know you build a better product out of it but 8 9 10 years back i mean this was just one role mm yeah right. exactly so yeah, i want to ask you about time. that yeah so i want to ask you about that right i mean like i think functions have matured right and uh, that cross functional aspect is uh, sort of missing right now and there are pros and cons to both of it right i mean i think with functions getting a lot more specialized you have a lot more in depth knowledge and lot more verticalized knowledge on specific things right but at the same time i mean it's about like four people talking to each other to do one thing so i wonder if you can weigh the pros and cons Of sure. of that itself, like how functions have become a little more siloed right now, a little more specialized, and uh, you know, getting these people to work as one cohesive unit. Right. So, like I said, you know, I you know, I had two phases at Paytm. One was very early 2010 when the team was small, mm-hmm. and then 2016 when you know team was really big. So I worked with people who were specializing in certain skill sets, and then I worked with journalists who would do a lot of things. Right now. in terms of pros and cons i think people right now who are doing who have verticalized knowledge let's say someone is a business analyst someone you know understands analytics better i think they will help you identify things which don't look obvious which are hidden but could impact the product journey dramatically think data which you know because of you know product manager doing multiple things 
does not you know uh, come across as obvious a good analyst uh, someone who you know has a you know deep understanding of how various platform works will be able to i think uh, bring it up bring it up uh, easily so similarly as a growth person you know if it is a shared role as a product manager doing growth they will do 10 things which which are good to have which are obvious that you have to do it like those are no brainer that as a growth person you need to do those 10 things you need to build a better funnel you need to build a better referral program you need to you know take care of drop offs but a dedicated growth person who has one or two kpis as their prs you know i think they can do a lot better job understand various segments they can build cohorts where they can instead of keeping one single experience for for everyone you know they can customize the experience for the customers they can personalize help in help product managers in personalizing the uh, consumer journeys they can even identify some of the steps in the life cycle which generally gets ignored like how do you optimize for for example maybe during the third or fourth transaction you see customer becoming a high value users first two three transaction they are just trying out but maybe as a product manager who is also looking at growth they are happy that their customers are doing three transactions Mm-hmm. but they might miss out on that finer detail which only a dedicated growth manager can identify that the moment they do fifth their chances of leaving the platform are next to negligible right now those are things which like i said as a product manager i'll be happy that my average uh, average transaction per customer is 3 but if i had focused more on customers who were doing three transactions six months down the line one year down the line my retention rates will be very very high because the people who would have crossed the third transaction uh, hump they would have stuck to the platform forever right so those are things which a dedicated growth manager can definitely help the product manager so right. i think there are better professionals today because you know they get a opportunity to go deep into their skill sets having said that product managers these days i think they are getting lot more technical when i interview product managers you know they talk about how they you know conceptualize the whole flow how they you know sat with engineering and you know came up with the right solutions how they actually build along with the tech lead build the architecture which you know can serve millions of requests and you know how it is saving customers time and you know things which are lot more technical which is good for product managers but you know their depth on once the customer has come in like i said you know the the classical problem that no matter how good the product is built but if you have uh, no usage then it is of no use so they have very i wouldn't say shallow knowledge but you know beyond a point you know they they would expect someone else to chip in right so you will uh, be able to hire that product manager maybe 3 months down the line you realize that you need a growth manager separately maybe 6 months down the line you need a dedicated business analyst which i think earlier those periods were longer like a product manager who had an exposure across not just exposure but hands on experience across two or three functions uh, you could could have a window of about one year till you start uh, expanding your team but these days you have to start expanding your team much faster right so so as a founder you need to ensure that very early on in your journey you need to start bringing in specialists because because like i said we all uh, these days i think are little impatient when it comes to seeing results so if you are impatient and you want to you know uh, make sure that you don't make mistakes get dedicated experts that get verticalized uh, you know uh, skill sets then you can achieve best of both worlds you can move faster and still not you know make mistakes but that also means you need to build a bigger team Right. right right so yeah so you need to figure out what works for you uh, like i said very difficult to find product managers who would come in and say for one year they you know may will not need support of you know two two or three functions but if you find one i think like just say 10x product managers i think just make sure that you know you you keep them forever yeah for it's sure very very rare breed these days yeah for sure and uh, i i think you bring up an important point right which is to go beyond the obvious three four or five things that one may do on these multiple different axes with the specialist and we can do some of these things early on you don't really have to wait for to get to the fourth or fifth one uh, after you finished a bunch of other things right and also i think having multiple perspectives itself is a good thing in some sense right i mean you don't always have always a good thing always yeah. a good thing right no at least i can today hold even though my because you leave anything for 6 months technology is changed right mm. so you have to really you know start all over again so unless you are continuously hands on uh, you have to continue to refresh your skill set right so for example i even though i'm not hands on on certain things but at least i can hold a meaningful discussion with you know most of these uh, people because at some point in time i did it so fundamentals have not changed mm. tools might have changed tools mm. might have improved new uh, ways of targeting would have come in new ways of uh, you know data analytics would have come in but 
fundamentally you know that what are the principles that one needs to follow so yes you can hold meaningful conversations and uh, that is an advantage at least i feel advantage for me and you know i am able to also share some of the loads that uh, load that they have initially so that way i think i also keep myself busy otherwise you know most of the time i'm just doing calls and managing people but i love doing hands on so i like to take you know some load off some of my team members so and that i can do because first of all i like doing it and secondly i've done that in the past so you know helps me refresh some of my skill set as well as you know helps helps us get the work done faster right so you've come covered a, a fair amount of it but i have to ask you this right so if a founder is listening to this podcast and uh, you know let's say for someone who's building in the consumer internet space right and uh, they want to set up a growth function right you know just to sum up your advice what are the first couple of things they should do uh, how should they define metrics who should they hire and uh, how should they go about it okay i think growth function starts from what is that one key metric which defines the success for you right mm. and it's by the way and that key metric can change every 3 months right. but at least you know that okay let's say i have launched a product uh, and for first 3 months my key metric no matter how superficial it is to but to get app installs like mm. blindly only objective is to get let's say app installs right mm. maybe 3 months down the line my key metric is to get number of registered users six months down the line my key objective is to drive transactions or maybe the day you launch the app your key objective is to drive transactions first of all you need to be as a as a founder you know you need to be clear that what is it that you want your product to achieve right for for next one quarter or two quarters and then work backwards let's say you zeroed in on that okay installs are useless for me uh, maybe i am a website i don't even have an app i don't care about visitors i need registered users because i need to have their either phone number or email because you know there's a use case that i'm building which requires me to collect their phone phone number and email then you obviously you know uh, keep your kpis accordingly let's say if you are building a content app where you you know where you want people to just come and browse and spend as much time your objective is that i don't care if they register or not they should be hooked to my app if someone you know discovers my app they should come 20 times in a month i don't need their phone number i don't need their email id i don't need their name so then your objectives are different then you know okay my objective is that this person should come back again and again and again in that case you know you will obviously try to create less of friction on onboarding and less of friction on you know content discovery so that you know the person who is using your app customer who is using your app they get what they want in minimal uh, clicks right so so first identify what are those what is that one i'm saying one particularly because everything mm-hmm. is then linked to that what is that yeah. one metric that i want to optimize for next 3 months right because early stage you only optimize for next 3 months right you can't optimize something one year down for for something that will come one year down right you because your app will improve your your product will improve your technology will improve your understanding of the market will improve your data will come in customers will tell you lot more so always keep 3 month 2 month targets and then just make sure that you know everything from your product manager if you are not the product manager yourself from your uh, you know te- technology head or head of technology whoever is the person who is responsible for coding it to your marketing slash sales slash business whoever you know are the key people they should all know that this is what we going to achieve for next three months yeah. so with any effort that all of these are putting in they should ask themselves that okay uh, today i have 9 hours in a day i'm going to do four things are those four things directly or indirectly going to help me achieve that kpi if not then you save time in the, you, know, you you don't do those tasks and you know prioritize things that will help you achieve that kpi so that becomes like a growth driven startup from early on because now everyone is aligned to that one single kpi you know all their tasks operation guy or a tele sales guy or a customer service guy they know that okay my objective whatever i am doing today if it is you know not helping in that i will three months down the line i will not i may not be useful right so i need to mm-hmm. make myself useful today like i said you know we are all impatient uh, when we are building and we want we want to see results that you know we believe that will help us take us to next level so everyone gets that clarity everyone you know works towards that one single kpi when everyone is working towards single kpi obviously not everyone will be successful you will have you know some good hires some bad hires some average hires but as long as they all are aligned eventually collectively you reaching those kpis now you know that is what i call without even hiring a growth person building the growth mindset in the company 
right? So that tomorrow, when you have the growth person coming in three month, four month, five months down the line, when you have some clarity that okay, you know, POC has taken off, your product market fit looks like you know it, you might be able to achieve it. That growth person now has a support of the entire organization because growth is not a single person's job. So that's why you know this head of growth or growth hacker or growth manager alone cannot do anything. Okay? Mm. They are literally, I would say, the single point of contact for reaching out to multiple stakeholders and ensuring that their contribution is resulting in the eKPI that company is achieve. So this guy becomes the, the channel manager or the guy who is, is keeping stock of all the things that we are doing, be it marketing, be it the product feature launch, be it PR, be it you know, content uh, that we are generating or be it the kind of uh, you know, schemes that we are doing or the referral program we are making. So he or she will now guide the product manager, guide the business person. So he becomes like the key person. And that is only possible if company or startup already had that you know, growth mindset. Unless otherwise, this person will, will keep pushing everyone. Everyone will have their own KRAs. Business person will have, oh, I need to achieve my sales target. The product person will say, oh, I need to release my features. The operation guy will say, oh, I need to you know, get as many you know, things cleared up in my uh, ops. Tally sales will say, Oh, I need to call as many customers. Customer service person will say, oh, I just need to reply to emails within one hour. Everyone then will have their own KRAs, which are, which like I said, which are just function. Right. And they collectively are not adding to anything. Right? right. So, so, so yeah, that's where I think early stage, you set up that culture very, very early. I mean, later on, this is once you become 30, 40, 50, 60 member team, it becomes difficult. Right? Then, especially these days when you're working remote, uh, you hardly get any chance to even communicate the entire team and explaining them, you know, what, uh, what are we trying to build together and what are we trying to achieve together? So it's very important that, you know, early on, everyone, the first 10 hire, key hires, 15 key hires, they know that what we are trying to do so that when they hire uh, people under them, they, you know, share the same uh, key KPIs with them. And then, you know, that culture builds on, obviously, like I said, you know, they'll be good hires, bad hires. Mm-hmm. Not everyone will be useful, but that way you can do hire fast, fire fast because you identify people who are not able to align themselves to, or to the startup's mission, right? And either they themselves realize that, okay, they are not cut out for, you know, this kind of growth or growth mindset, or I think their manager realizes and they start looking for better placement there. So I think it becomes a little cutthroat. Yes, when you are very growth focused, it is when you're very number focused, everything is quantified, but nothing is uh, subjective. You don't really say why, you know, talking to 10 people, but you think, okay, you're talking to 10 people, but you know, where is the final partnership? If you don't, if you're not, you know, brought the numbers, mm. uh, you spend the eight hours talking to 20 people will not help, right? So, so yes, it, it is little, I, like I said, you know, may not suit everyone, but that's how I think good startups get formed, right? They need to, they need to ensure that everyone is earning their salaries because when you become big, when you hire 200, 300, 400 people, you know, this becomes difficult to track at scale. But like I said, if you do, if you ensure that early on, you have all the, you know, right principles growth principles uh, in place. It will not be big pilgrimage uh, when you have 5,000 people. You know, there will be people who will not you know, be aligned, but you know, at least you know that everything that everyone does has to result in certain numbers. Wow. So that was an excellent point, right? Because I think one of the traps is to have a situation where everyone does their work and still you fail. Right. I mean, that's, uh, so that's like I said, now, everyone is doing work. <laughs> yeah. person is answering queries, operation guys, <laughs> optimizing operations, business person is chasing targets yeah. in terms of their sales. Yeah. Everyone is doing their work, but then, yeah. you know, collectively they're all missing the, the missing yeah. mission. Yeah, that's a, that's an absurd situation to be in, right? And uh, I think that is where having a North Star metric clearly defined and having that one metric where all like functions, I, I, I everyone. You, KTM, yeah. it was very clear. Now I'll tell you why Paytm saw that rapid growth. The only one metric that Paytm changed for three years, for three years, mm. was unique transacting users. That's it. Mm. There was no GMV, no revenue, no cost saving, no uh, multiple use cases. As long as we can get more every month, month mm. on month, more and more unique transacting users. Mm. Everything else will eventually happen. Mm. Right? Then you, you know, once you have a large enough base, then you say, okay, now there will be people who are responsible for making sure that the users do a, a more than one transaction. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, when they do third or fourth transaction, they you know, start generating right kind of GMV. Now, you know, 
if they are generating right on a gmb now how do i spend less cash back on them so that now they become start start to become you know unit norm is positive to me right all these things will eventually happen but unless you have a large enough base you start to optimize way too early in your journey then you become you might become very tight profitable or a revenue generating startup but may not have the scale of paytm for example if paytm would have you know started optimizing everything uh, in 2016 that mm-hmm. no i need to be unit norm is positive on every action that user takes i need to ensure that customers are generating enough gmv i need to ensure that you know they are doing multiple use cases that would have been you know uh, i think uh, optimization done way too early right so mm-hmm. like i said you know you need to identify when is the right time to do these optimization tasks because if you do it too late then you know you might uh, start literally lose the momentum that you built earlier on but you have to time it really well right so yeah. so so the point i'm trying to make here is that that key single kpi that paytm had actually held paytm to then start focusing downstream but i think for 2 3 years everyone in the company knew that any feature that they would take to either vijay or to me or to anyone else the question would be asked will it bring in new transacting users or will it get the existing transacting users to come back right mm-hmm. because monthly transacting user is the target now whatever you are building if it is going to achieve that let's go ahead and do it right yeah i mean this is a topic again that's very close to my heart as well that i can the other thing is i mean during this phase right i mean there'll be like a ton of things to do right so how do you really prioritize and having that one metric become it becomes uh, so much easier for you to just uh, prioritize absolutely i think i could not uh, stress more on the value of uh, you know having this north star metric and you've articulated that extremely well i want to move on and talk about scale but before that i want to ask you about something that uh, i talk about often right which is the quantifiable stuff and the qualitative stuff and to me i think you need to have a fair balance of both but today i mean we see that you know with the with the data that we have the dashboards and the funnels and 20 30 metrics that you can really track people uh, somehow have become very there is a tendency to have this tunnel vision syndrome of only looking at these charts and graphs and trying to tweak numbers and not really for instance you know picking up the phone and talking to 50 of your users or customers right so i want to understand from your perspective how does a good growth person balance both of these and how would you advise uh, them to sort of prioritize these things and certain hacks that have worked for you on that front i think qualitative stuff i think you rightly pointed i think uh, everything can't be quantified right mm-hmm. there are certain things that you do which either just brings a happy feeling or brings a smile on customer's face and may not really result in anything else let's say for example how do you really greet uh, your customers when you know they write to you you know mm-hmm. how do you really respond to customer tickets what kind of language do you use you know when you when when they call how quickly you solve their uh, issues now these are things which you might overspend and see okay customer delight i cannot today quantify that you know if customer who writes into me uh, if i delight them even if even if they are not our customers but just a user trying to inquire something how much impact will have in the future but let me invest today in making sure that you know i that one opportunity that i have to interact with the customer i make the best of it like the reason i'm saying this is this is what we do at india gold we know that you know 100 leads that will come in 98 are not interested mm-hmm. but how do i treat those 98 users i know that they are like i said i'm you no know, antithesis of what i said you know those 98 users are not uh, you know helping my key kpi of my loan book but i need to build a strategy for those 98 users as well how do i greet them how do i you know follow up with them how do i keep in touch with them when they come to app you know how do i really greet them you know these are things which like i said you, you lose when you're too number focused when you are you know too data driven and when this is a cut through target based product uh, product kras then you know these are things which are always discounted at okay you know let's not worry about uh, people who are not transacting with us because they are not adding any value right mm-hmm. but you'll have to take you know some certain product managers you know they take that leap of faith that no you know if today i am handling those nightly customers well maybe one of them converts maybe they tell their friends maybe your referral works maybe they do things which you know help you be- get better uh, word of mouth so take those gut calls you know there's no way to prove it sometimes you know good product managers will fight their way out and say okay i want to build this feature because this might because they also don't have any historical data that this might bring new customers because this is one feature which customers may like it but there is no way to prove it that because historically you know you never done something like this there's no other example that you see in the market but you came up with the idea because you know you felt that 
you know some of the customers who left the review they left on play store the negative reviews that they left on play store or, or the uh, interaction that they had with the customer service you feel that you know this could have been solved by building uh, x feature like i said you know you in a cutthroat way you will not target those users but a good product manager will say no i will devote 10-15% of my time building features which are not data backed but my gut says or my research says which could again be like I said research could be very superficial but this product manager takes the responsibility of ensuring that you know the key KPIs are still not overlooked but we you know do not stop building things which we are passionate about right so that's how you discover new products that's how you know innovations happen that's how pivots happen otherwise if you if you stop every if you do everything uh, database I think companies will either be very successful or they will die. They'll, they will never pivot. Pivot happens or new innovative products come from existing companies because they keep a window open of things that may not make sense on paper, but eventually, you know, deliver results. Okay. And at Paytm, we had several such examples. I, I won't name it, but right. several such examples of passion, passion projects, which became like big money spinner. Nice. Right. Okay, so speaking of uh, Paytm, let's talk about scale, right? The other unique aspect of your experience is that you have seen true scale, right? You've seen the 0 to 1 to 10 to 100. And I think perhaps, I mean, Paytm was at uh, uh, last I checked around 300 million plus users, right? So, you know, a lot of things change at each of these stages. But at true scale, what are some of the nuances that you notice in terms of acquisition or retention and how do these things change? I mean, if you could just give us a very broad idea of like what truly changes at scale. I think at scale, attention to detailing goes away. That's the sad part. The good part is that you can still make few mistakes and you will not lose customers overnight because the large product or the large base allows you that flexibility. But larger the product, larger the base, build something, you start seeing results quickly because you know, there are a lot of millions of users, uh, like in Paytm's case, any feature you launch will quickly be adopted by lakhs and lakhs of users. Mm -hmm. Now, as a product manager, you know, I will feel happy about it. But maybe the product which is being used by 5 lakh people, which in itself, in absolute terms, is a big number, maybe it could have been used by 2 to 3 million users. But since uh, there's no way to find that out, we are happy with 5 lakh and the attention to detailing goes away because everyone feels that, okay, people are using it and numbers are coming in mm -hmm. and let's move on to the next product or feature. So anything that could have increased that 5 lakh to 2 million gets missed sometimes because like I said, you know, absolute numbers itself are so high that you, uh, right. you start comparing with the outside world. Oh, you know, no other app, <laughs> even though it's a feature in Paytm, but no other app has so many users, right? right. Whereas you don't know that the the potential that you had with that product could have been 5x, 10x more if you had put in, you know, a lot of attention to dealing. So those are difficult to manage at scale because like I said, you know, you're always gifted with users coming on for anything that you build. Uh, you also get false feedback, right? Now, if let's say on day one, you have 20,000 users using your product, you say, oh, wow, my product is a hit. You never know. Maybe, you know, if it was done in a different way, maybe you know, 2 lakh people would have used it, but maybe actually did a great job instead of 1,000 people who would have actually used it, not 20,000 using it. So, Sometimes, you know, those feedbacks are difficult to come in when you are at scale because broad numbers now supersede all these finer details. No one has time to now go into specifics because everyone has some large, large, large target. Like for example, at scale, you will talk about the next billion dollar GMV or next 20 million users. Right? You will not worry about 500 users losing because of bad customer service, right? right? So yeah, those are things which, you know, uh, starts to break at scale. So any, any organization which can balance these two, keep that attention to detailing intact and still, you know, continue to build for scale. I think they succeed. And I'll particularly tell you about Vijay here. Vijay is attention to detailing. He would not worry about the larger picture because he knows that he's hired good people who will take care of that. Mm -hmm. He would go into specific details, like literally the last detail, like, okay, in our IVR, the menu number six should have been this. Now for Vijay to even get into that, no, everyone will say, oh, that's, I think that's not required. But I think the way he was structured in his mind, he would always pick up things which everyone will ignore because, you know, everyone thought that, you know, those things, we are big enough to even ignore those things, right? So, so he used to balance that out. And even today, I think he's the best, best product manager that Paytm has, despite, you know, Paytm having at least 100 well-qualified product managers because he looks at product differently. You know, he's not worried about, he... While he gives those targets that, okay, we need to do, you know, 200 million users, 300 million users, 
he knows that you know those larger numbers an entire company is working towards it that will happen but the leaky bucket below i mean that is where i think if someone is not focusing he will make sure that you know product managers do not miss those finer details so he he has brought in that attention to detailing culture which i think again paytm is big enough so again his bandwidth is also limited i'm not saying that you know he gets into everything but like i said you know if you can if you can you know continue to have that kind of focus not just at founders level because founders can't you know uh, do it for the whole whole company when when it is 5000 people strong mm-hmm. every product manager if they you know continue to be as focused on it i should dealing like vijay is today now imagine the kind mm-hmm. of product you know uh, the the army of uh, pms can create so 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 that is where i think uh, like i said at scale if you can balance these two you can do you can do uh, wonders to your uh, uh, growth so, I, uh, so that's the only thing that gets missed that's everything i think at scale like i said feedback loop to product managers is something that is not com- not it's very superficial right mm-hmm. uh, so i think a good product managers when they built a smaller product and then grown with it i think they learn a lot more versus a product manager who simply assigned a product which is already working which is already big and you know they don't understand that you know what it takes to get from 20 users for one first day to 20000 users at the end of the month right so mm-hmm. yeah so those are things which you know in bigger bigger startups it doesn't really come up and a good product managers again would stand out if they if they start focusing there and that was my filter by the way that despite all the load despite all the big numbers that we all need to generate who's worried about those smaller leaks that are happening right yeah and you catch that uh, only through some random sampling right like what <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> because I, i think okay everything boils down to your personal passion and productiveness right. you know Right. proactive people they compensate for you know, some of the skill set that they may not have as long as you are proactive about things or okay i need to find out why this happened mm. i need to fix this i need to you know figure out uh, you know reasons uh, behind you know something not working or something working and they uh, instead of you know someone telling them to go do it they themselves you know proactively find out talk to team members talk to engineers talk to marketing guys talk to business guys i think those are i think some of the best hires you can have and you find those guys out right you give a task to someone and when you forget about that task and you know that task will happen i think those are the best guys i mean skill sets can be learned skill sets uh, you know someone can spend 3 months in learn coding but i think uh, there are certain skill sets that are inherent which cannot be taught and that is where good hires and average hires are separated right absolutely so okay let's talk about india gold right and to me it seems like one of those ideas that is so obvious on hindsight right yes of course uh, people in india love gold right and most of that wealth is just lying there not earning any interest uh, not really working and at the same time at the other end you have people who are starved of uh, working capital business loans etc so it's kind of an ideal match making opportunity that you're facilitating could you talk about you know how did you go from idea to product to company and also some of the common use cases that you're serving right now i think when we started working on the idea i think idea was not india gold india gold name came much later and the product also came much later mm-hmm. but we looked at the landscape right i mean when me and nitin were uh, looking at multiple things i think the common theme was that we need to build something around a uh, lending space right because mm-hmm. uh, we believe that you know while there are hundreds of fintechs trying to do lending there are nbfc there are banks which uh, which just survive on lending like banks main revenue is from there and we have seen you know large nbfc is there but why is it that you know all the banks put together all the thousands of nbfc put together all the fintech put together india is still highly credit underserved right why that out of 650 million working age population only about 150 million people are eligible for mainstream uh, credit why people who do not have good credit score people who do not have regular income people who do not have you know businesses which are you know in good shape uh, or several other factors why are, how do we solve credit needs for them because everyone needs credit it's not that only 150 million people need credit right i mean yeah. the, the the economy can only grow when you know someone who right now is struggling to build uh, a business but you know for last 3 months they not been able to generate enough working capital so their business is you know literally shut but they know that if they can get some credit they can buy raw material and start working 
but like a catch 22 or a loop where they get stuck in where they go to bank or an nbfc or a fintech who says oh sorry you don't have any business how can i give you credit right you know that person you know needs credit to start the business right so there are several millions of such users in india right so it okay you know if all these banks and nbfcs and formal financial institutions exist then why do we have a large unorganized lending market right india literally has 3x bigger credit market than what banks and nbfcs can serve you know these your you know your money your roadside money lenders your in villages you have those you know a uh, loan uh, you know those shopkeepers giving small credit payday loans and those chinese have that came in that gave you know loan worth 3 4 billion dollars why do people go to them right. because you know they don't get access to the organized credit from uh, formal institutions so yeah that's where the i think the the problem statement was that okay can we can we build a product which can at least if not all 400 million people who who want credit at least some of them you know start to get credit and that's where i think uh, we change our focus from unsecure because in an unsecure we realize that you know while if there are 100 startups already focusing on it 20 30 will build something eventually where you know that 150 million will become 160 170 175 so collectively they'll all expand mm-hmm. the universe mm mm-hmm. uh why do i need to be another 101st startup there and build something which you know uh slowly expand this can i you know get into this market and take a different route that's where we thought okay asset backed lending is something that we should look at and we started thinking at what assets that indians own so three assets that stood out number one is property i think most of the indian uh, assets are locked in the houses that they bought second one of course we all know is gold then there is uh, insurance right insurance almost 250 million insurance policies endowment policies exist i'm calling it an asset because many people don't know that they can take loan against it right right so you thought okay you know there are these three assets that indians own property obviously uh, may look like a secured loan but we realize that you know, it's it's a tough one it's not it's because it's not liquid right you can't liquidate property overnight and recover money so that's where we thought okay let's you know let's look at assets that are liquid that are movable and i think the most obvious answer was yes gold india has tons of gold but then you'll see oh but then india has large 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 public sector companies like mithun manapuram one is 6 billion dollar another is 4 billion dollar they have a book size of 50000 crore collectively all the nbfc have book size of about 2 2 to 3 lakh crore banks have a book size of 5 to 6 lakh crore so if there's already 7 to 8 lakh crore worth of you know gold loans being given you know isn't that already being covered you know that's when you start you know getting into start peeling the layers and realize no india is such a massive country 280 million households out of 280 million households almost 240 million households have some form of gold right now and say so, okay now this is also not good enough to even get it to this market let's see if we can bifurcate further so we said okay first of all let's remove the below the poverty line household which is roughly about 60 to 70 million right while you will be surprised by the way below the poverty line while we say they are below the poverty line but they they do have gold but let's say you know that gold is not enough for us to monetize so let's say the gold amount is 2000 3000 they have a small chain so okay let's let's exclude that uh, and then also let's exclude people that we see around us people who live in our society people who live in our vicinity people like you people like me that's the top 2% of india right by the way we all belong in top 0.5% we don't realize that i'm saying let's even take it further say okay let's move top 2% so if you remove top 2% which is people like you people you see around you bottom 40% you still left with 150 to 170 million households hmm. who have almost 600 billion dollar worth of gold lying in their homes and this is well distributed so i have removed you know rich people like you ambani's adani <laughs> and anyone who's got 100 grams of gold or 1 kg of gold i'm removing that you know i'm not even catering to that i said because they will have they will have access to alternate credit they will have access to personal loans business loans all forms of loans they'll have credit cards they don't need gold loans below the poverty line you know let's not let's not target them how about these 150 170 million households how many of them have actually taken gold loans then we realize this less than 20% have actually ever in their life taken gold loan so the 80% of household who have gold enough gold they are not credit eligible for most of the mainstream nbfcs and banks 
why are they going to money shark um, uh, loan shark why are they going to money lenders unorganized ones because this is the like i said the middle of india which you know had doesn't have regular income they don't file any income tax they don't have any itr to show and they are self employed non professional because that is what india is and india is not people working for startup that's just that's just the just the kind of view we meet but that's not india right so we said okay now that is a sizable market 140 million households who never been even touched by muthur manapuram and banks who are giving gold loans and i said okay what what is the reason for that multiple reasons came out distribution is one stigma came out to be the biggest of the reasons mm-hmm. and several other logistical operational issues that came in so okay let's see if, as a startup if i can relook at the product that exists from hundreds of years companies like muthur manapuram that exist from you know 40 50 60 70 years doing the same business Right. Banks like SBI and HDFC and ICICI doing this business forever and doing like you know they have a book size of two to three four billion dollar right? Can I relook at this whole product and see if I can build something which is transparent, which is simpler, which is customer friendly, which solves the uh, operational issues, security issues, trust issues, stigma issues, all these issues. If I can you know some of these issues I can solve obviously. I, you know i'm not i'm not claiming that we can solve all the issues if some of these issues i can i can solve maybe there's a market maybe we can fundamentally bring in new set of users to this credit market and that was the that was the day when we said okay you know we see the market very clearly and we need to operate here because for us it's a blue ocean it may look like a red ocean from outside that all big companies doing it but for us you know we identified our blue ocean and good that we did that i think we are very happily placed right now slowly we are trying to you know build products which are bringing in users which who who, who had never experienced gold loans their first time you know experiencing it some of them are actually liking it we already have we are in, i think ninth tenth month of our operation we already have 50% of our users repeating their loan with us right so we see that you know users you know we brought into the circle their first time gold loan users so we are happy about you know those metrics we're still saying okay my loan book is x crores right well that will happen you know once once we hit scale uh, you know we'll worry about aum we'll worry about yield we'll worry about you know all those uh, bottom line and top line numbers but right now i'm happy about the kind of users that we are able to bring in to this fold right so that's where i think our mission started and, and, and like i said we are in the right direction and hopefully next couple of years you know we will we'll be able to help few millions of these users to avail credit which is reasonable which is uh, like i said easy to get faster and very very transparent fantastic i mean it, it's amazing to see how deliberate you have been in choosing the market that you want to play at so that's pretty amazing if i were to force you to wear your product person's hat right and uh, with everything that you know about the user that you're catering to what are some of the nuances of building for these users they may not necessarily have transacted on a similar uh, thing on any other app right they may not be used to the product and so on right so what are some of the nuances of building for these people and also for a layman like myself like looking looking at it from the outside what what are some of the non intuitive things as such with with the building the product for these people as such i think good question so when we were doing our research while we were building the product the tg that we thought would come in would be 35 plus mostly self employed non professionals people who are you know, people like factory owners shop owners small businessmen people who work from home traders now the good part is that you know thanks to india's internet adoption and smartphone adoption at least they have smartphone and they have internet right thanks to jio and most of them use whatsapp And that was a starting point. That okay, if I can replicate the simplest of experience that today WhatsApp offers, like WhatsApp, literally, you know, my dad can use everyone. I see a worker who comes to our house; they are comfortable using WhatsApp. I said, okay, without our guiding principle will be that everything has to feel like how WhatsApp feels to the customer. So that's where you know we deliberately. when we were doing our user research the kind of designs that we built the kind of uh, flows that we built we tested it on users who generally probably major who never go to right these are your uh, kirana shop owner right. these are your you know house uh, help which is uh, you know coming uh, coming to your house your drivers or swiggy delivery boys or people like these who who use smartphone but they will not worry about the nuances or the finer details in the app they straight away want to get to the use case 
that what is it that I'm using this app for, right? Uh, WhatsApp could have built a very fancy chat mm-hmm. app. They deliberately avoided that. They say no, yeah. they are coming in for chat. Said, okay, people are coming to my app for a billing credit. Can I make it a simpler experience? So I said, okay, you know, if I was wearing my product manager's hat and if I was disconnected from users, I would build a flow where users would come in. They will select the right plan. They will select the amount. They will upload their pan. They will upload. They will you know do Aadhaar, EKYC. Then I will you know show them their eligibility. I said no, we will lose the users by then. While that is like a ideal flow which good tech and product platform should have. Right. But I need to understand my customers. They are right now in not uh, you know that frame of mind where they will go through this pain. Uh, under- please understand for an unsecured loan. they go through this pain because in unsecured the start the company has to trust the customer whereas in secured where they come and seeking gold loan the customer has to trust us correct right because we are taking their physical gold yeah and if, if here the customer has to trust us i need to find the fastest way to talk to this customer right right that's why i said okay it may look unsexy but can i quickly give one option to the customer when they come to my website because most of our traffic actually is through m web even though we are we have million app installs but m web surprisingly you know again like i said out of consumer research we realize that you know without m web we can't go to the market while well, app is good to have is a good showcase but m web will bring in large traffic and the only ct on our m web is give a miss call to this number or send a whatsapp to this number send a whatsapp to this number right and you click whatsapp opens and then you start interacting right hey. now the problem is oh customer has gone out of your website they are not using your app no i am very focused i am trying to solve this customer's credit need right now hmm. once i have an opportunity to communicate with the customer now eventually customer will use my app because they have to they will see track their gold jewelry using the app they will repay using the app they will renew using the app and eventually will slowly graduate them while they can pay from whatsapp via email the link will be sent but gradually will educate them okay by the way you know your loan is expiring can you can renew it or you can you know you, uh, there's a cheaper rate of interest you can readjust your loan so we will encourage them slowly to use our app because let to understand when we are giving credit to the customer i'm building a 6 months to 1 year relationship it's right. not right. one time relationship where i want desperately want them to use my app because i know if i convert this customer they will come to my app so you know that we resisted the urge to have that wonderful you know app only flow where you know we request every information digitally and then give eligibility to the customer like i said if i was building it for you and you were the gold loan customer i would build a product differently mm-hmm. you know i would let you to do a lot of stuff yourself and then at the last step i come in right that's where i think prog manager coming in from pure digital product would resist building something like this oh you know you are literally you are collecting the phone numbers right you are right. not not doing anything but like i said you know you have to understand why we doing this i am not in the business of app installs you know i my i will not be valued when i say i have million installs i will be valued when i say i have 5000 customers who i have converted who taken loan from me right so let like i said that key metric was very clear hmm. right you want app installs you want customers who take credit from you so if you want customers who want who take credit from you you want the fastest way to reach to them right hmm. so that's just give you one example but there are several other things that went into the design where uh, you had to specifically keep the tg in mind i was not my tg is not cred like tg right cred would not build a product like india gold because their tg will say oh, what a crappy product it is <laughs> right mm. because they are exposed to multiple of uh, multiple apps which are you know, good looking which serves you know a lot of uh, features and you know they actually help them uh, improve their overall uh, journey but in our case like i said you know single use case uh, tg which was not really interested in any fancy stuff that i am doing they were interested in the end goal which is money in their bank account right yeah and i was just looking at your website and it's it's so interesting that you have used uh, rakesh bedi hitesh tejwani and the rest of them again like i said <laughs> you have to keep your tg in mind no exactly, uh, exactly. like i said uh, it may look unsexy to like people like you me including i am myself maybe my my family but you know you have to understand who are, who are you talking to exactly yeah 
No, that's amazing. Any other ways that you're building trust and credibility? Because again, you know, what you rightly mentioned is that you're getting people to part with their possessions, right? Their assets. And uh, gold has a very emotional bond with the people also, right? I mean, uh, it's not just viewed as, let's say, like a mutual fund or like some yeah. kind of cash or, or whatever, right? It's not just an asset. It's a, it's got a very social, emotional sort of a connotation to it, right? And uh, I mean, if you see, look at Tamil Nadu, for example, right? I mean, it's something like 30% of the asset allocation is in gold, apparently, right? So yeah, it's how big, big or not? Big, big, really big. Kerala right? has some really astounding numbers yeah yeah so you know any other ways that trying to build trust and credibility not just with the product and the marketing messaging and whatnot but various other aspects right i mean various other touch points for the customer itself anything that you could share on that front no little let's see trust first of all is not built overnight right and trust Correct. requires you to continuously doing good things over and over again so for example even simple thing like if you take loan from us hmm. zero processing fee Zero renewal fee, zero foreclosure fee, no hidden charges. Like literally no TNC apply, right? When you mm. give a loan and say no TNC apply, what are we saying is what you will actually pay. Mm. There's no hidden term, right? Mm. Now, once they complete the term with us and they know that, okay, what we promised and we actually delivered. Now this person, first of all, will come back again. And we already seen 50% of them coming back again. The word of mouth will spread. So I think these are things which you build into your product. Yeah? The way mm -hmm. your customer service talks to the customer, way you resolve your uh, resolve the queries. The simple thing like we give two days grace period when they delay the payment. We sometimes even give three days, four days extended. We don't we don't have a hard coded date. Okay, you're you not paid, so you know your loan is in default. Mm -hmm. you know, we understand that customers may have issues, so we actually allow customers to even you know, readjust their loan when they are not able to pay after three, four, five, six days. Right. So these are things which you build so that customer knows that, okay, this company is not here to take my gold away. They're mm -hmm. actually, you know, giving me credit. They're keeping my gold safe. I am able to track my gold seamlessly in the app. I know my gold is safe with them, but they are helping me in my need when I need it, you know, not here to put penalties on me or put charges on me. Mm -hmm. So that is, like I said, uh, slow trust building measures, which comes from the product. And when I say product, this product is the financial product that we created, like mm -hmm. my scheme. So you build a transparent product, you build a good customer service, you empathize with the user, you slowly walk them, like I said, you know, uh, handhold them and graduate them to start becoming a pro user from a very basic user. You know, all this over a period of time uh, helps build the trust. Like I said, we are just seven, eight months. I wouldn't say that we are a trusted brand, but the reason why we were able to get customers because we gave personal care to all first 500, 600 customers who actually helped us get another 50, 60 customers. So, you know, this chain is slowly increasing and hopefully, you know, we continue to not just retain these users, but these users will eventually become our brand ambassadors. Because gold loan is one product where once you start trusting us, you are not going anywhere. And gold loan is one product where repeats are very high. Unlike personal loan, where you take personal loan for two years and then, you know, maybe you don't repeat for next three, four years. Gold loan people repeat quite often, like almost 70, 80% of people repeat gold loans. And they would only come to you if you've, you know, uh, not broken their trust. So like I said, you know, we understand that we need to do a lot of small, small things and not really TV ad will not solve it. One print ad will not solve it. But if I, you know, show them, like I said, even simple things like, you know, showing friendly faces, you know, showing the transparency that, you know, the insurance from new India insurance, ICS insurance, where the gold is being stored, where, you know, which bank is giving them loan, all that. As long as it is transparent, I think over a period of time, trust will get built. We are not worried about that because like I said, we are being honest with our product approach and it is getting translated into the end, end offer or a product that we push to the customer. Right. Yeah. One of the things that I'm really most optimistic for is that people like you are building in this space, right? Because if you look at how conventional banks or, you know, lenders typically treat uh, customers, it leaves a lot to be desired, right? No, because and, they're demand and supply, right? Yeah. Customer needs, demand for credit is so high right? that customer will, you know, not worry about getting bad experience or, you know, getting fleeced or getting, you know, or paying extra because they desperately need credit. So, mm. and all this gets exploited at every level. Mm. We're exploiting the customer needs. So that's why I think the, the demand supply is so skewed that no one bothers about the experience that they need to give customers.
Right. So Deepak, this has been a fascinating conversation, right? We've overshot our time by about half hour. Thank you so much again for being so gracious. Love interacting with you. Right? Right? So one final question before I let you go, right? I mean, you've had a two, two decade plus career now. And you've done this zero to one, 200 sort of a journey multiple times in this time span, right? And, uh, you know, having had some experience on that front, I know that it saps a lot of your energy out, right? So how do you retain your passion to learn new things, to execute, to go full throttle and like be able to put that same amount of effort and care into everything that you do? I think one thing that has worked for me, I have always changed my career trajectory every four years. You know, I, like I said, I was web designer, then became a web developer, then became a product manager, then became, you know, a growth person, then, you know, started looking into business. So I have never, you know, literally (laughs) done the same thing for more than three, four years. So that forces me to, you know, learn new things like gold loan for me for like, I had absolutely zero. I didn't even know this market exists when I was at Paytm, right? This was not even crossing my mind mind ever, right? So I had to literally, you know, uh, learn basic things. And the reason why I do newer things, because it helps me learn and I would rather look like a fresher whenever I start, because, you know, that ways I keep myself excited. I know that, you know, there's a lot I don't know today. If I continue to do, let's say product for 20 years, I'll be like a boring old uncle (laughs) who will be, you know, giving instruction to other product managers and I will have no zeal or no excitement to be called a product manager. Right. All right. On that uh, note, I think we should end this podcast. Thank you so much. Again, Deepak, really appreciate your time. Thank you, Roshan, for having me. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked this episode, then don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite platform and share this episode with all of your fellow startup operators. Also, follow the startup operator on LinkedIn and Twitter for more updates. Stay safe, take care and see you soon on a brand new episode of the startup operator.